All right, thanks everybody. Um, I'm uh, Jordan Smoller. I'm, I'm, I have the privilege of uh, hosting uh, today's Worldwide Lab meeting, and I'm super excited about it. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a really interesting um, presentation and I hope discussion. Uh, before we get started, just to mention that the, the meeting is being recorded. Um, we encourage people to uh, ask questions as we go along in the chat. And then when the presentation is over, we'll open it up to a, a, a Q&A uh, and, you know, unmute people if they'd like to ask their question directly and so on. If you have an urgent question during the presentation that you want me to interrupt the speaker for, uh, put that in the chat. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. David Ledbetter. Uh, uh, David uh, is probably known to most people here he is a uh, has been a leader in um, uh, medical genetics, uh, genomics, um, clinical genetics, uh, and uh, importantly the the use of health system data and genomics in real world settings, and has been thinking and writing uh, extensively about what this is going to all mean, what the kinds of discoveries we're making uh, is going to mean for clinical practice and really uh, driving the leading edge, I think, of uh, many of the advances of psychiatric genetics into uh, clinical practice. He is the executive vice president and chief scientific officer at Geisinger, where he has really developed, uh, you know, a, a internationally renowned um, uh, uh, system that uh, delivers genetic results to uh, patients. He's professor. Uh, uh, in the uh, Autism and Developmental Medicine Institute, uh, a friend, and I'm, I'm thrilled uh, that he's joining us today to talk about uh, diagnostic testing uh, in the context of neuropsychiatric disorders. Over to you, David. Thanks very much, Jordan. It's a pleasure to have the chance to talk to you today and represent the Geisinger Autism and Developmental Medicine Institute team, uh, and I'll refer to some of my colleagues here. Uh, all of us have clinical training and clinical interest in genetics and genetic testing um, and try to incorporate that into our routine clinical care in both pediatric settings and now moving into adult settings. So before I go too far, I want to acknowledge the major uh, partners and contributors to this um, lecture. I've borrowed so many slides and ideas from Brenda Finucane and Krista Martin that I don't know what's mine and what's theirs anymore. That's a good sign of team uh, behavior. Brenda presented a similar topic uh, at last year's World Congress of Psychiatric uh, Genetics, um, and I think many of you know uh, Krista Martin as well. Um, I am a scientific consultant to two companies, Natera, primarily in the prenatal diagnosis area, and Extherma, but will not be discussing any products or services from these companies today. The objectives today are to differentiate clearly clinical genetic testing from genetic analyses in a research uh, sort of setting. This group has been leaders for many years now in the application of GWAS and other research tools to uh, get genetic insights into adult psychiatric conditions. Uh, we're interested in the translation of that knowledge from research into routine clinical care. Uh, so I'll start with describing um, the current clinical application of rare and highly penetrant genomic variants, both single gene, um, <clears throat> Uh, loss of function mutations and copy number variant disorders in neurodevelopmental and other brain uh, disorders. Uh, we'll highlight both the clinical medical utility and personal utility of making a genetic diagnosis or determining the etiology of rare genetic diseases in children as well as in adults. Uh, and we'll use a very extensive clinical experience and data from pediatrics to inform how we start thinking about and making recommendations for routine genetic testing in adults with neuropsychiatric uh, disorders. So again, types of genetics testing so that there's no confusion or overlap in the uh, language used around. I'm only gonna talk about the first category of clinical diagnostic genetic testings, mean, meaning in a CLIA clinical laboratory <clears throat> with a official clinical genetics test report, 
primarily talking about exome sequencing and uh, aimed at identifying rare causative genomic variants with very high penetrance. Uh, this is to determine the cause or etiology of the phenotype or symptoms in individuals. And as I said, we'll focus on the highly penetrant genomic disorders, although there's significant variability in expressivity of severity in particular phenotypes. I'm not gonna talk about GWAS, which this group is very familiar with, although we, like everybody else, are very excited about the future potential for translating GWAS data into polygenic risk scores to determine individuals' potential um, increased risk of adult psychiatric conditions based on their uh, additive genetic background. Uh, and pharmacogenomics I consider as a separate category of genetic testing related to medication response, and uh, there are far more experts in this group, in this area, but I separate this from clinical diagnostic genetic testing and won't address that today. <clears throat> in pediatric setting, uh, going back 10 years now, there was an expert consensus statement that we were involved in <clears throat> that we should move away the uh, traditional G-banded karyotype and start uh, doing chromosomal microarray testing in all children with unexplained developmental delay, intellectual disability, and highlighted in red, autism spectrum disorders. Uh, shortly after this expert consensus statement was published, the American College of Medical Genetics uh, produced an updated practice guidelines, and their recommendations are shown on the next slide in September of 2010. <clears throat> And again, recommended as a first line test, that means before you do a karyotype, a chromosome microarray should be offered to any child with <clears throat> non-syndromic developmental delay, intellectual disability, and autism spectrum uh, disorders. Uh, so we've been 10 years where that has been the recommendation by the genetics professional organizations, and many of us would consider it standard of care um, to uh, offer and perform chromosome microarray in this group up until recently. Uh, <clears throat> there was an update in 2019 where Mustafa Sahin and David Miller in Boston organized a, an expert consensus panel uh, and then a process to do a meta-analysis on all published data through 2019 uh, both a scoping review and meta-analysis on the diagnostic yield of exome sequencing for global developmental delay, intellectual disability, and autism spectrum disorders, with the highlights from that shown here. Overall yield of exome sequencing was 36%, 31% for isolated neurodevelopmental disorders, and 53% if there were other associated conditions. The recommendation of this expert uh, panel was that exome sequencing outperforms chromosomal microarray and most clinical genetics testing labs now can do very good copy number assessment, copy number calling for CNVs from an exome sequence. So a single test, exome sequencing with copy number calling uh, can be used as a first tier diagnostic test. This has not been adopted uh, or recommended by a professional society yet, we would hope that the American College of Medical Genetics and others would consider uh, endorsing this consensus statement and moving us all to exome sequencing as our first year genetic testing in this broad uh, pediatric neurodevelopmental group. Uh, I'm not gonna walk through the systematic review process just to show the highlighted red box which shows exome sequencing plus CNV calling is now the single test that can be recommended, thus simplifying the decision-making about what genetic tests need to be done in a pediatric setting uh, with developmental delay or autism spectrum disorder. A colleague of ours, uh, Daniel Marino De Luca and others published recently in JAMA Psychiatry a short letter where they analyzed data from Rhode Island on about 1,300 participants with confirmed autism spectrum disorders to determine how many had standard clinical genetic testing at the time of this analysis they considered Fragile X, 
testing and chromosome microarray testing to be the clinical standard. And only 3% of the 1,300 confirmed ASD uh, children and individuals had appropriate clinical genetic testing. So at least from our perspective, there's a significant gap between the published literature and at least guidelines from the medical genetics um, professional society and the behavior of uh, clinical providers who are seeing children and making diagnosis of autism and autism spectrum disorders. So what are the barriers to implementation of appropriate genetic testing that some of us would call standard of care? Um, <clears throat> so there's inadequate clinician knowledge outside of medical genetics uh, field. Um, and we uh, spend a lot of time trying to write and give talks to help educate uh, other clinical specialists uh, outside of um, medical geneticists. There's a cost and in insurance reimbursement, although the cost we've argued to our local uh, health plan uh, can be the same or less than MRIs, which are often done multiple times over a child's um, uh, evaluation and lifetime without significant diagnostic or clinical utility in the major great majority of cases. Uh, we have been able to convince Geisinger Health Plan now several years ago, and they routinely reimburse TRIO exomes. So if you do exome sequencing on both the child and both parents, it's more informative and results in a higher diagnostic yield. And Geisinger Health Plan does that with a very streamlined preauthorization uh, process that allows any uh, developmental pediatrician, uh, child neurologist, child psychiatrist, or pediatric geneticist, or genetic counselor can order TRIO exome sequencing uh, for any child with developmental delay, intellectual disability, childhood epilepsy, or autism spectrum disorders. The time and logistics of test ordering and the follow-up with results, and I'll talk a little bit more about the consent process and ordering in just a minute. Uh, the perceived lack of clinical utility outside of the professional genetics community, and we'll talk more about how we view both the clinical medical utility and personal utility of uh, having a genetic diagnosis or etiology to the clinical diagnosis. Uh, and there's a long time tradition and preference to refer to medical genetics. Unfortunately, there's a shortage of physician medical geneticists, so that usually results in a six to 18 month wait list for the patient family and many patients never follow through with those appointments, so they end up with no uh, genetic evaluation and no genetic testing. Uh, at our Autism and Developmental Medicine program, we've tried to streamline um, exome sequencing with copy number calling as our primary first-year genetic test. Uh, we refer to it as the five-finger approach to consent and think that this consent should be done in five minutes or less. It can be done by our physician providers who are neurodevelopmental pediatricians. It can be done by our uh, neurodevelopmentally trained PAs, nurse practitioners, our clinical psychologists, as well as our genetic counselors. Uh, and you see the outline of this five-figure consult. We may find a positive result that explains why your child has the developmental cognitive behavioral problems that they have, and this may lead to medical uh, changes and avoidance of some comorbid medical conditions. We may get a negative result, which didn't help us, and we may need to do other testing. Uh, and it does not mean it does not have an underlying genetic condition. We just didn't find it. You could get an uncertain, ambiguous so-called variant of uncertain significance. This is not really any different than any other medical test where there are results of uncertain significance. You might get a medically relevant and important secondary or incidental finding, and we give patients the option to learn about greatly increased risk of cancer or cardiovascular disease, and they can choose uh, to receive or not receive that. And you may identify uh, unexpected familial relationships, including uh, non-paternity, uh, 
but this is a routine aspect of all genetic testing, and we've been dealing with this in the medical genetics profession and genetic counseling profession for many decades, um, and there are pretty straightforward ways to uh, deal with that. So this summarizes our uh, evaluation of the literature on the genetic causes and etiologies of neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric. So uh, uh, around 40 to 45% of children with broad neurodevelopmental neuropsychiatric who are referred for clinical genetic testing have a positive identifiable genetic etiology that's broken down pretty evenly between copy number variant disorder, CNV disorder shown uh, in the purplish color, and now with exome sequencing, single gene disorders, including fragile X, but other uh, single nucleotide variants or point mutations uh, in genes like CHD8. So at the bottom it shows CNVs are about 20%, exome sequencing positive, about 25%. We can break that down into intellectual disability, and my image is blocked here, sorry, um, is uh, 15 to 20 percent CNV yield, autism 10 to 15 percent, a little lower, pediatric epilepsy about 10 percent, schizophrenia a little bit lower in this number, but I'll show you later a suggestion that may be similar to autism in children and adults. Uh, at five to 10%. Uh, exome sequencing for the group as a whole, again, about 25% positive, clear pathogenic variants as the rare variant cause or etiology of the disorder. <clears throat> so it's been more than a decade now, decade now that Jonathan Sabat and others first pointed out that in schizophrenia, there are a number of different rare structural variants, CNVs and single gene mutations now, uh, that can be associated with greatly increased risk of schizophrenia, uh, but also for the same genes in the same CNVs, the primary clinical manifestation can vary uh, between intellectual disability in some children, epilepsy in other children, schizophrenia in some uh, children, adolescents or adults. Um, <clears throat> Our version in some of our publications of a tabulation of CNVs with uh, variable disorders, uh, variable phenotypic expression are shown here, where you see some of the most common copy number variant disorders, starting with 22Q11.2 as the most common uh, across clinical cohorts which is identified in children with autism spectrum disorder, children referred because of intellectual disability, as well as adults with schizophrenia, and children with um, um, pediatric childhood epilepsy. So you see uh, in the schizophrenia column, quite a few of the CNVs are significantly associated with schizophrenia. Similarly, when you look at a growing list of single genes strongly associated with autism risk, and that number is at least 500 genes, probably more than 1,000 and likely to be um, uh, uh, several thousand, if not tens of thousands of genes, uh, have uh, autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, as well show up in schizophrenia, uh, exome sequency, and epilepsy. So our group has referred to this um, range of neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric conditions as developmental brain disorders. Um, a group of neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric conditions I've highlighted in red, the primary ones we'll talk about today. We've talked about autism spectrum, intellectual disability, epilepsy in pediatric cases, and then schizophrenia as the primary disorder we'll talk about in adults. <clears throat> so our group are strong uh, proponents of the notion that a genetic diagnosis through clinical genetic testing is really important and valuable both medically and personally. So we talk about clinical utility in terms of anticipatory medical guidance, as you know, uh, individuals with these CNV or single gene disorders have high frequency of comorbid uh, <clears throat> developmental, uh, psychiatric, 
as well as physical medical problems, sometimes cardiac uh, problems, sometimes uh, renal problems, other medical conditions. And we can anticipate and monitor those children uh, and make earlier diagnosis and intervention. Uh, we hope that soon uh, identifying these uh, genetic subsets of uh, individuals will make our clinical trials for treatment of children with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism more successful because we reduce the heterogeneity and identify patients with common underlying pathophysiology that might respond to specific pharmacologic uh, intervention. Uh, it's important for genetic and reproductive counseling for individuals and families in terms of potential recurrence risk. And since many of these are de novo events, both parent, neither parent carries the CNV or the uh, single gene point mutation, frequently we lower the recurrence risk of autism, for example, uh, compared to those children and families who do not have a de novo rare variant present. And personal utility, we'll talk about this a lot more throughout the talk. Um, they get plugged into um, uh, family support groups and can meet and interact with families with the same uh, rare genetic condition and uh, learn from them what the developmental trajectory, health trajectory, learning trajectory uh, over age ranges uh, from those other families. Um, <clears throat> we find that our patients really respond to having an explanation that they have an underlying genetic medical condition, which we refer to as medicalizing the behavioral, cognitive, psychiatric problems that a child has, is really viewed as very valuable to parents in the case of children and to adults who have these rare genetic conditions themselves. And we'll come back to that uh, in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> there's a sense of increased empowerment and engagement uh, with uh, the medical community and behavioral health uh, providers as well uh, as a result of understanding the medical and genetic etiology of the condition. So a simple uh, example of this, these three, three children all have diagnosis of autism. So at a uh, behavioral description and clinical diagnostic level, uh, they have similarities. Uh, but each has a very different underlying rare genetic condition, and there are different comorbidities, medical problems, um, uh, educational expectations and interventions for each of these three. So we feel like it's a compelling example that a, uh, an accurate genetic etiology diagnosis is very important for these children and for their families. Um, the bottom uh, comment is, again, hopeful that uh, understanding the specific etiology will allow us to develop uh, more precise uh, and hopefully beneficial etiology-specific interventions. And this will be influenced not only by the particular rare variant, but as we're learning now the common genetic variation and the genetic background as measured by polygenic risk score influences the severity of the clinical features in these children with rare genetic diseases and may allow us to predict future development and future medical problems more accurately for these children and adults. So one case presentation coming out of a research finding in a 34-year-old woman diagnosed with epilepsy, learning uh, disabilities, bipolar, uh, and my screen is, and psychosis. Uh, identified through her research participation in our Biobank MyCode to have a pathogenic 15Q1 3.3 copy number variant deletion. Uh, she was counseled uh, about these results, uh, and the counseling emphasizes the unifying etiology of this genetic disorder for multiple different behavioral, cognitive, um, and psychological or psychiatric um, brain conditions uh, that she um, uh, told us about. There's a discussion about guilt, I, guilt, shame, and stigma, and often when they understand there's a medical explanation uh, 
uh, for their behavioral cognitive psychiatric condition. It relieves guilt, uh, removes social explanations uh, and other uh, sort of personal and family explanations for their learning difficulties, anxiety, et cetera. Uh, in this case, uh, this woman had had one stillborn, which could be uh, related to her carrying a genetic disorder that sometimes is associated with cardiac defects. Um, and understanding and recognition this deletion was present from birth and there was nothing she could do about it. Uh, Follow-up studies of her um, first-degree relative shows two daughters, uh, both with the same deletion, 18-year-old uh, with uh, low average intelligence, some learning disabilities, uh, uh, previous epilepsy and ADHD, and a 10-year-old uh, daughter with moderate ID and uh, questionable ASD. Uh, again, the mother now expressed relief uh, understanding there's a unifying medical explanation for the family's medical and uh, brain disorders. Uh, it caused her and the family to re-engage with their medical providers after many years, uh, and particularly her daughters were referred for overdue neurologic and developmental care with specific recommendations uh, about their clinical care, behavioral and educational needs. And the family became actively involved in volunteering for research around the 15Q1 3.3 deletion CNV condition. Um, <clears throat> there's now anticipatory medical guidance in terms of significant epilepsy risk, increased potential for adult onset psychopathology, uh, and awareness to seek early treatment uh, genetic counseling about reproductive decision making uh, and the potential uh, to participate in research and the hope that there may someday be treatment specifically beneficial uh, to individuals with this uh, CNV disorder. And again, the patients and families continue to remark on the positive um, impact on them when they understand the underlying medical explanation for their uh, lived experience, learning um, problems, anxiety, other behavioral and psychiatric uh, problems. So this is the way we used to draw um, pedigrees and family histories uh, in medical genetics and for genetic counselors. And you'd list the individual cognitive, behavioral, or psychiatric diagnosis. And when we used to look at pedigrees like this, we'd say, oh, this is a very unlucky family to have all these different things uh, happen to them. Now with genetic testing, we can identify that all of these individuals have the same underlying rare genetic disease with variable clinical manifestation in each individual that we think will be uh, influenced by each individual's different genetic background uh, as measured by polygenic risk scores. So we're now one of our most active areas of research interest is looking at the influence of polygenic scores for educational attainment, IQ, uh, or psychosis, uh, and other uh, areas to push a child in a strongly um, uh, cognitive um, uh, severity versus uh, behavioral and psychiatric direction to explain and to predict and explain this clinical variability. So I'm going to switch a little bit now so that I can talk more about adults and what we know about the prevalence of the same developmental brain disorder genomic variants, both CNVs and single gene mutations uh, in adults. Um, so as uh, Jordan alluded to, Geisinger began a large biobank and genomics project back in 2007, so now 13 years ago. Um, <clears throat> we have now consented over 266,000 Geisinger patient participants. In a partnership with Regeneron Genetic Center, we've done exome sequencing and genome-wide SNP genotyping on over 144,000 of those patients. Uh, and then for the last five years, since 2015, we've been identifying, clinically confirming, and returning to patients and their uh, providers medically actionable results. And I'll define that a little bit more. Uh, 
uh, and that's on 1,600 um, probands uh, or participants uh, who originally volunteered for a research biobank genomic study, and now we're giving them back uh, what we think is important medical information about their risk. And these are mainly risk of early onset cancers, breast, uh, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, and early onset cardiovascular events, uh, heart attack and stroke. So we've initiated the study uh, following definitions proposed by the CDC and the American College of Medical Genetics Secondary Findings Committee, uh, which my colleague Krista Martin is co-chair of that uh, committee. Uh, that includes 61 very high evidence genes for high evidence for the gene being associated with high risk of a particular disease, as well as high penetrance and actionability. Uh, we're only reporting clear pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants. We are not reporting variants of uncertain significance to avoid uncertainty and anxiety associated uh, with this. This is a scorecard of our MyCode um, um, project to date. So over 266,000 consented. In the middle, 144,000 have had exome sequencing and SNP genotyping. Uh, 62, over 62,000 have had exome uh, sequencing and have a proper consent for us to review and confirm clinically relevant. And of those over 1,600, have received a clinical result that goes into their EPIC EHR uh, chart, um, is reported to the patient where we offer them a genetic counseling session, and it goes to their primary care physician, and we offer to uh, include the primary care physician in genetic counseling or participating uh, in follow-up uh, discussions with the, with the participants. This uh, 1,600 is a 2.5% yield. Now remember, this is an unselected healthcare population. So these are all adults, average age of about 50. Um, <clears throat> they're coming into primary care for um, a variety of routine uh, uh, common conditions of adults, not specifically for high risk of cancer or cardiovascular disease. And this 2.5% is consistent with uh, other studies around the United States and around the world of so-called population health screening or uh, healthy exome sequencing studies. <clears throat> now, if we take that same cohort um, and we say, what about uh, neuropsychiatric CNV disorders and single gene disorders in these unselected adults. So most studies of neuropsychiatric phenotypic effects have investigated clinical or research uh, results. So they've been uh, clinical cohorts, so selecting for individuals that are uh, have a diagnosis. Sorry. <clears throat> And these studies, these clinically ascertained studies are obviously biased towards um, the more severe phenotypic consequences of these genomic uh, variants. So we wanted to gather data on an unselected healthcare uh, population. Uh, and then we internally discussed whether or not when we found these clearly pathogenic CNVs or single genes, would we report them back to our adult MyCode biobank uh, volunteers? Uh, and because of our clinical expertise uh, in children and adults with these CNV disorders and single gene disorders, we decided that we would offer to return results back to these adults who are uh, in the, the great majority of cases unaware that they have an underlying rare genetic condition. Uh, in our minds, this is strictly too analogous to a very common occurrence in a medical genetics clinic and that is you do genetic testing on a child with severe features of 22Q deletion disorder that may include uh, cardiac and other physical medical uh, conditions as well as uh, developmental behavioral problems. We routinely recommend testing the parents and about 10% of the time find the same 22Q11.2 uh, deletion in a parent who um, was thought to be unaffected, although they frequently uh, 
uh, have mild features of the condition when they're seen in person and examined uh, by medical geneticist and we get detailed uh, educational history and medical history uh, from those individuals. <clears throat> So because of that, we um, did a more in-depth study of clinically confirming uh, initially copy number variants from our MyCode adult biobank population. This was published recently in JAMA Psychiatry and led by Krista Martin and Karen Wayne, shown here on the slide. And we were particularly interested in the prevalence of pathogenic CNVs, the penetrance, and the clinical but also personal utility of identifying and communicating presence of these neuropsychiatric copy number variants back to these adult patients. So first addressing the prevalence, uh, this was based on 90,000 exomes, which makes it one of the largest health system based populations. Um, this part of the study was led by uh, Dr. Matt Ogens and uh, uh, Abby Harris, who's shown uh, uh, to the right. Um, and we chose uh, a group of uh, 31 best described, best known pathogenic recurrent variants, uh, and that includes CNVs like 22Q11.2 uh, condition. The CNVs were called from the exome sequencing data using an algorithm called CLAMS developed at Regeneron, but then we did a CLIA confirmation before reporting any of these results with a very high uh, percentage of confirmation of the research exome data. Uh, the most important conclusion is that in this adult population, uh, these neuropsychiatric CNVs uh, are pretty common. Almost 1% of all adults who volunteered for our biobank um, uh, genomics project, 0.8%, uh, identified with just these 31 clear pathogenic CNVs. Of those, only about 6% had a previous known geni genetic diagnosis. So remember, they're in their 50s on average. So when they were children, uh, uh, chromosome microarray was not available. Uh, so it's not too surprising that these adults in their 40s, 50s, and 60s uh, had not had what is now considered routine genetic testing. Uh, if we compare our results, which is the first column called Discover, the collaboration with Regeneron, to Decode Genetics publication from Iceland, the Estonia Biobank publication uh, is the EGCUT, egg cut, and then the UK Biobank prevalence. The prevalence, uh, particularly across all CNVs down in the bottom roll, is about 1% in all of these unselected biobank populations for these clearly pathogenic CNVs. Uh, and in all of these cases, those who are brought in for medical exam and for personal medical history and family history uh, frequently have many uh, milder clinical features of the particular CNV disorder. Uh, this table shows some of the um, CNVs that were looked at in the blue arrows uh, point to some of the more common and those that are uh, best known and described clinically that may be familiar to many of you uh, in the audience today, uh, as well as duplications and some of the more common ones also highlighted by the blue so I invite you to look at the details of this JAMA psychiatry paper. So what about penetrance? So these are pretty rough estimates, but we went uh, first to the electronic medical record of these individuals, uh, and we focused on nine of the 31, those that were the more common and had the best, strongest evidence of neuropsychiatric features. And you'll see at a high level, if we include common uh, um, psychiatric uh, diagnoses like depression and anxiety, the documented presence in EHR is 77%. If we exclude the common ICD codes for depression and anxiety, it's still 50% documented in the EHR. Now, we suspected and then confirmed that the clinical features were greatly underrepresented in their EPIC EHR chart. 
So after clinical confirmation and um, reporting these results to a number of patients, you see here the darker gray is the percentage of features documented in the EHR. The light gray uh, shows the additional information um, not documented in the EHR. Let's see if I'm... Yeah, that's right. So dark gray is EHR prevalence or penetrance, and the light gray is additional findings not uh, present in the EHR. So what about personal utility? Um, so again, these are the nine CNVs chosen for detailed analysis. <clears throat> the requirements for returning the results for the participant had to be at least 18 years of age with adequate consents on file. And they were contacted and asked if they'd like to receive results that we thought might be relevant uh, to their health now or in the future. <clears throat> this is uh, one case story example of a 48-year-old man in my code uh, <clears throat> found to have a 22Q11.2 deletion and typical of the adults we called. He remembered volunteering for my code, remembered that he had agreed if we found something relevant to his health, we'd contact him and offer uh, to talk to him about it. He agreed to come in uh, to be seen by our genetic counselors. And like many of these adult patients, lives still with his parents, never married, uh, did graduate high school, was employed, um, uh, drives and independently manages his finances and appointments, had a typical facial appearance of 22Q11.2 deletion, no history of chronic medical conditions or surgeries. Uh, he did report, and this was not in Epic, that he had a psychotic episode at age 35 that required hospitalization, responded well to medication, but then his psychiatrist tried to wean him from his me medication with subsequent recurrence of psychotic events. Um, he was uh, actually quite positive about understanding the genetic etiology of his condition, that it was a medical condition, and more importantly, a chronic condition that he had to deal with for the rest of his life, um, and <clears throat> was satisfied with the notion that he did much better on continued low-dose antipsychotic medication uh, and that he and we would recommend not trying to completely wean him from his medication. Uh, I won't try to go through all of the themes and quotes uh, 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 outlined again in the paper, but you can see uh, a number of major categories where in many cases it provided an explanation, provided an underlying medical condition, relieved guilt, um, and sense of self was either unchanged or improved. So there were no significant negative reactions, emotions, or impact on sense of self uh, from our patients. So a fairly uniformly positive uh, response, significantly outweighing any negative responses, which were mainly uh, immediate short-term um, uh, reactions to hearing the genetic test result uh, that were alleviated with additional uh, counseling time and information. Uh, these results are actively incorporated into their personal narratives, their sense of self, understanding of their medical condition, um, and that this sometimes applied to other family members and their family's understanding of their own uh, um, school problems, learning problems, anxiety problems. So the key takeaways here are if we take the 0.8% copy number variant disorders, and now we're looking at single gene disorders in the same group, and now have at least 1.4% of an unselected healthcare group have clear pathogenic single gene or CNV disorders. Uh, penetrance is, we would call, quite high. And one of the major conclusions of individuals and family members is positive reaction to understanding the medical etiology for the individual and sometimes multi, multiple family members, so-called medicalizing. So if you, as 
for those of you who are adult psychiatrists in the audience, if you started ordering exome sequencing as a clinical diagnostic test, what would you expect the yield to be? Unfortunately, we don't have quite as much data on adult clinical testing as we do for children. Uh, some of the best studies, and I know that the um, um, Psychiatric Genetics Consortium and many other groups such as the uh, Cardiff group of Michael Owen and his colleagues have published a number of very nice research papers showing the increased frequency of pathogenic CNVs in schizophrenia compared to controls. One of the most clinically relevant papers comes from Ann Bassett's lab published in 2013 in uh, Human Molecular Genetics. I chose this paper because they had two independent clinical cytogenetics laboratory directors to evaluate the CNVs and identify pathogenic CNVs by clinical uh, standards, and they identified 8% of adult schizophrenia, and this was from a community-based schizophrenia cohort. So again, I think it's a real world and relatively practical and conservative estimate uh, of the diagnostic yield of CNVs. Uh, and just recently, a paper was posted on Med Archive from Mark Daly's group uh, at the Broad on exome sequencing meta-analysis of schizophrenia from some 24,000 schizophrenia cases in a case control comparison, greatly increased rate of um, pro protein truncated variants in cases versus controls where that they used to estimate approximately 6% of schizophrenia uh, have uh, protein truncating variants relevant to their schizophrenia risk. And in their analyses, this frequency of 6% is quite similar to uh, the same kind of analysis in autism spectrum. They identified 10 genes significantly associated with schizophrenia risk with odds ratios of three to 50, and I'll show you a, a nice figure with that, and 22 additional candidate genes with a false discovery rate less than 5%. So with more data, we'll have a growing number of rare genetic um, individual genes. Uh, this is their figure two. The red dots show the um, 10 newly identified strong candidates with uh, odds ratios of 3 to uh, 50. Uh, and then the orange dots show the candidate genes at a somewhat lower uh, level of odds ratio. Uh, they also have a nice figure in that paper that shows the relative contribution of copy number variant shown in green to single gene mutation shown in red versus common genetic variation in blue to the far right, uh, plotted on uh, prevalence along the x axis and odds ratio for schizophrenia along the y axis. So you see copy number variants tend to have a larger effect size and are more prevalent than uh, individual gene uh, point mutations. But collectively, if we add these two together, I would take the 5.7 or 6% protein truncating variants uh, from this recent meta-analysis, meta add that to the 8% CNVs from Ann Bassett's paper I showed you earlier to come up with a current best estimate of 14% if you did diagnostic exome sequencing with CNV calling in an adult schizophrenia patient. I think this is gonna prove to be a very conservative estimate and as we start doing more clinical testing, uh, I expect this will be easily in the 15 to 20% uh, range. So this is the same slide in terms of barriers to implementation I showed earlier in a pediatric setting and my plea to child psychiatrists to think about exome sequencing in every child with autism. Now to the adult psychiatrist seeing um, schizophrenia, I'd say we're, we're uh, close to, if not already at, the point of routine uh, clinical testing for every adult with schizophrenia. Uh, and the easiest way to get started with that is identify a genetic counselor at your institution. Um, all genetic counselors are experts in genetic testing uh, and can help you figure out how to get done. Uh, if you don't have one or can't negotiate a partnership, call us, we'll try to help you out.
Uh, cost and insurance reimbursement is a problem in all genetic testing, but costs are decreasing rapidly and there is improved reimbursement. And I'll tell you what Geisinger Health Plan is doing in just a second. Logistics of test ordering, we talked before about simplifying consent to a five minute or less uh, procedure. We've talked a lot about clinical utility, so I hope that you've been at least partially convinced. Um, and there's an unfortunate precedent um, for genetic testing by other providers to uh, want to refer to a physician medical geneticist for evaluation prior to genetic testing. This is simply not practical because there aren't enough medical geneticists and typical wait times are six to 18 uh, months. David, just a, a reminder that during genetic tests. So part of our educational mission from the Geisinger ADMI group is to help other uh, providers outside of medical genetics to become comfortable ordering their own genetic testing and partnering with an internal or other genetic counselor uh, to get that done. Uh, the test, yeah, or I'm on the last slide here. Oh, great. So, um, you know, part of the problem with genetic testing in the past was there are a lot of different kinds of tests you can order and it was confusing. Uh, but I think we're rapidly moving, converging on exome sequencing with CNV calling as the single test for the analysis of all pediatric patients with neurodevelopmental disorders, as well as now adults with schizophrenia and other psychiatric conditions. So in 2019, Brenda Finucane led the charge at Geisinger to present this data to our uh, health plan uh, and convince them to add psychiatrists to the list of providers who can order exome sequencing at Geisinger, expanded the age range, uh, eliminating the arbitrary age cutoff of 18 uh, in pediatric uh, criteria because all of these children with intellectual disability, ASD, grow up and become adults. So now we can uh, routinely offer exome sequencing for adults with schizophrenia or other chronic major psychiatric disorder in the presence of epilepsy, congenital anomaly, or a family history of other developmental brain disorders. So I am at the end now and will acknowledge the entire team at Geisinger uh, shown on the left, but particularly Krista Martin, Brenda Finucane, and Karen Wayne, as well as our collaboration with Regeneron and support from National Institute of Mental Health for much of this work uh, and our Regeneron uh, partnership. So I'll stop there and Jordan, you can referee the Q&A session. Fantastic. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was really uh, absolutely fascinating and again, uh, giving us a, a window into the frontier of what genetic testing might be. Uh, and I did provide the slides, Jordan, as a PDF okay. to Grace that she can distribute to everybody or anybody that wants them. And if anybody needs PowerPoint slides, they can contact me and we're happy to provide them. Fantastic. Okay, so let's get to some questions with the, the remaining time we have. Uh, in the chat, David Curtis uh, was asking about um, clarifying, I guess, the use of CGH array for CNV calling versus exomes, uh, and how, do, how are you thinking of that now? It sounded like you were thinking exomes kind of. Yeah, we go straight to exome now. So routinely our first tier genetic testing, we still order fragile X testing on many of our patients, but then we go straight to exome sequencing with CNV calling and we find no difference between the uh, CNV identification by exome versus chromosome microarray. Great. So cer certainly do not need to do both tests. Another question that was in the Q&A was uh, relatedly, uh, what's the resolution at which you can reliably detect CNVs using exome uh, for whole genome? It's around one to 10 KB or less, depending on the pipeline. Yeah, so for exome, it's not that small. And I might ask Krista Martin if she can unmute to help me with the resolution that we're routinely getting. You know, we started with an expectation. So all of the recurrent CNVs, which are the ones that we want to report, are a minimum of about 500 KB in size. So it routinely identifies all the known CNV disorders. It does not identify single exon and other small intragenic CNVs reliably. 
but it usually will get whole gene. Any deletion of an entire gene uh, is typically identified. Krista. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, so I think most labs would say at the exon level for deletions, they're getting comfortable on exome sequencing with uh, one to two exons. Uh, for duplications more, so three or greater, I think it, it varies by laboratories, but I think the calling uh, algorithms are getting better to get to some of those intragenic exon calls. Great. Thank you. Um, Let's see, uh, people should feel free to, to type in their questions or if you want, unmute. Uh, while, while people are thinking of them, let me ask you another question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about the, you know, obviously the, the sort of pleiotropic or, or variable expression maybe is, is even a better uh, rendering for some of these CNVs with things like autism spectrum disorder or schizophrenia, et cetera. So when, what, what's your take on counseling uh, uh, families of children who come in for a neurodevelopmental disorder, um, uh, you know, workup uh, about the future risk of psychosis, but also other psychiatric disorders. How do you guys handle that? So are you asking based on a polygenic score alone or a polygenic no. score in the presence of a rare variant? No, I'm talking about a, a CNV that might, that might um, oh. confer risks to, you know, the, this whole increasingly broad spectrum of disorders uh, for which the penetrance we, we may or may not know for some of them. Yeah, so uh, we interpret most of the data is there's an extremely high penetrance for some neurodevelopmental or neuropsychiatric disorders, and we can only describe to the parents and family the range of different cognitive, behavioral, psychiatric uh, potential uh, mild to severe manifestations on each of those domains. And right now we can't predict for an individual child, whether it's gonna be primarily ID, primarily ASD, or primarily adult schizophrenia risk. Our research is can polygenic scores or assessment of genetic background help us to refine those prognostic predictions and help us to predict which ones might have more a higher psychiatric risk or schizophrenia risk, for example. Uh, we just don't have the data yet, but we think that that data might be useful clinically in refining a more precise prognosis for individual patients. Okay, we have a few folks who are now unmuted uh, who may wanna ask questions. I think David Curtis or Ed Cook or somebody wanna have a question. Hi, David. Uh, good to see your presentation. Uh, good to see you. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, insurance companies need to come around to the idea that uh, adult testing is indicated. They seem to flag it uh, just because it's an adult, uh, whether it's ASD or ID. And uh, I just commented that the the one that they turned down, uh, the CME, CMA would have been negative because uh, it was a de novo POG-Z mutation in ASD. Uh, we'll be writing up the case report because it's going to have GI implications. Yeah, so Ed, on one of the slides, I commented that uh, Geisinger Health Plan, which obviously is uh, very influenced by uh, our group and our experience, has revised their uh, reimbursement policy, and they're happy to share that with other providers or other health plans. And sometimes having an example like that could be educational or influential on another uh, insurance company. So we hope uh, that that will change, and our health plan is happy to try to participate in education of other insurance companies. Thanks for leading in that way. Time for one more question. Anybody want to jump in? Um, this is Brenda Fanukin. I, I, not a question, but also just to add just a little bit to the previous um, question about your question about like what do you say to families when they have a child with a CMV? I just from the genetic counseling standpoint, one of the things that's so helpful, even if we don't have exact percentages of their risk for schizophrenia in 20 years, let's say, is just to really take the time 
to talk about this whole continuum of brain disorders and put it out on the table early on because they're going to be reading about it there and you know they get all freaked out really just to have a discussion with them they're already having a child who's got some kind of developmental delay maybe intellectual disability maybe autism and just to talk about you know these are all behaviorally defined conditions even all the way up to the very scary schizophrenia bipolar disorder etc and so to get them sort of to be thinking about this and mo and and really what i say also as a genetic counselor is you know most people have no idea for example with psychosis you know that it's coming and if you were at some risk not that you should be hyper vigilant but you know this is a good opportunity to talk and make sure you're aware that your child is not going is going to practice good brain health and mm -hmm. you know should not be using marijuana certainly um uh, uh, or other types of insults to the brain and just sort of um, incorporate into your life all the good things that you can do to try to um, preserve brain health and be aware to take early action if there are changes noted. Great. Um, I, uh, the, thank you for that, Brenda. Uh, regrettably, we have to wrap up. There are um, um, undoubtedly more questions uh, and I just want to take a, a moment to thank you again, David, uh, for a, a superb presentation. Thanks, everybody, for joining, and um, have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Jordan. Enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.